Everyone, welcome. Thank you for attending our session today. We have Josh Mandel, um, and he is talking about SMART. Perfect, yeah, so I'm excited to, to share with folks uh, an overview and in some ways an update on the SMART Health Cards framework. Um, and this is a way to help individuals get access to their own clinical information in a way that is bound to their own identity and in a way that's verifiable. So we'll dig into the details of what that means and how the health cards framework is being used. Um, before we do this, let me just note that there's a link to this slide deck here at the bottom of the, the first slide, and I'll include that in the next couple as well. So if you want to follow along, several of the slides have embedded uh, links to resources and demonstrations that I'll be showing as we go. Um, and for folks who have seen information about health cards before, uh, this is gonna look familiar. I wanna start by sharing a little bit of vocabulary, uh, but, but very rapidly, you'll start to see the progress that we've made over the last year. Um, so I wanna call out one of, the, one of the core sort of definitions in managing relationships between different kinds of entities uh, on the web or electronically. Uh, so on the one hand, you might have an individual patient who's interacting with a healthcare provider or a payer or a pharmacy or even a retail store. And there's a few interrelated challenges here that I want to give some quick labels to so we can talk about what's in scope for the health cards project and where we're trying to really make a difference. Um, so on the, on the top of this list here is identity. Uh, and these are questions about who are you, maybe in the, in the sort of real physical world. Um, what, what person are you within a, a given country or what qualifications do you have within a given uh, clinical certification system? Uh, and how do you demonstrate this to somebody that you're interacting with? Those are questions around identity or identity proofing. Uh, next up is authentication. So these are questions like, how do you sign into a system? How do you make sure that you can securely maintain control over your own account in that system and that other folks uh, can't log in as you or pretend to be you? Uh, and then finally, there's a whole host of decisions and controls around sharing and privacy and, and transparency. And this is really the area where health cards is going to be focused. I wanted to delineate it from uh, the other two, in, in part because over the course of our work in health cards in the last year, we've really narrowed down our focus uh, to this bucket, and you'll get a sense um, of just why that's the case uh, as we dig in. I want to say just a few things about this sharing and privacy and transparency bucket. Um, effectively, to, to try to argue that uh, today things are in many ways kind of a mess. Uh, I'll use the context of US-based uh, healthcare and, and regulations uh, to highlight that on the one hand, um, sometimes information are shared in ways that people don't expect. Uh, and so where, where somebody might not realize that their data are flowing between two health systems uh, or between a health system and a payer or uh, other technology companies in the mix, uh, people can be surprised to learn that this kind of sharing can be perfectly um, legal under HIPAA. So it can be surprising to consumers even though uh, it's something that our regulatory framework contemplates perfectly well. These are disclosures for things like treatment or payment or operations, where a HIPAA covered entity has a pretty wide berth to share. Um, on the other hand, individuals under HIPAA have a right to an accounting of disclosures. So the idea being, uh, if a health system is sharing my data with, with others for some purpose, I have a right to know uh, with whom they're sharing it and, and why and when. Um, in practice, this doesn't really work great. Uh, it can be difficult to get uh, your hands on that kind of information at a level of granularity that makes sense. Uh, and then there's various kinds of escape hatches. So data that have been de-identified according to the, uh, the HIPAA rules uh, can actually be shared or sold um, without counting as a disclosure uh, of an individual's health information. Uh, but in practice, that de-identification can often be undone. Um, so we often have data that are being shared about individuals in ways they don't understand. And the flip side of this is Sometimes sharing fails in the places where people would most expect it and most want it to work. Uh, so for example, in the context of clinical care in the US, if you show up at a hospital that you've never been to before during uh, some kind of emergency and they try to look up information about you, that information can be hard to come by. We have some na national level exchange networks. We have some vendor specific exchange networks, uh, but none of these really has full coverage or, or enjoys kind of robust uh, availability across the whole health system. And at the core, the way that all of these data exchange networks uh, operate depends on a little bit of guesswork. They depend on a kind of probabilistic patient matching so that when uh, one health system is looking up data about an individual, they might, they might know 
uh, the name and birth date and, and broadcast a query for information about other individuals with that name and birth date. Uh, but there can be false positives and false negatives. Uh, and so information doesn't always flow through these networks, um, even though over time the networks um, have gotten better and better. So these are some of the challenges around transparency and, and privacy when healthcare data are shared in the US. And I want to contrast these uh, with modes of exchange that are much more consumer mediated. Um, so the work that we've done on the Smart Health IT project, for example, falls in that category where an individual consumer can connect an app to their records. That's an explicit consumer choice. And so there's no surprise about which connections have been made. Um, and the work that we've done in Smart Health Cards also fits in that category to say an individual can take explicit steps to decide to share a very small piece of data sometimes or a small collection of data uh, with an organization uh, or with another uh, trading partner that they choose when they choose. So there's a growing set of technologies to help make these kinds of consumer mediated uh, data sharing work. And I'm gonna highlight one that we're using in the Smart Health Cards project called Verifiable Credentials. So these are uh, specifications that have been standardized and are continuing to evolve within the World Wide Web Consortium and within the Decentralized Identity Foundation. Uh, and the basic idea here is that a, a credential, a verifiable credential is a kind of digital artifact uh, that works a lot like a physical card might in your physical wallet. Uh, the idea being anyone can issue you one of these cards uh, that has a certain set of information baked into it. And you can hold on to it as a consumer and share it or show it to somebody when you choose. Um, and these kinds of verifiable credentials or the data in these credentials can be mixed and matched. So if you've got a few different cards, maybe one insurance card, but also um, a card demonstrating that you're a valid driver in a given state, you can present those things together and show that you're a driver and that you have insurance. And being able to do that might be very powerful in uh, facilitating booking a rental car and streamlining that process. Uh, and there's a really important aspect here, which is all the work that goes into issuing these credentials can be amortized. So you get a copy of this credential once, maybe from your insurance company or from the DMV in this scenario, and you can hold on to it and reuse it downstream many times. So even if the process of issuing it um, might involve some cost or some inconvenience, uh, or maybe the, you know, the state has to invest considerable resources in issuing these, these kinds of artifacts in the case of a driver's license, that cost is amortized uh, downstream over multiple uses. So the basic model looks like this. Uh, there's three key participants or roles in this ecosystem. There's issuers, which are organizations that know some information about an individual and are willing to create a, a credential and, and give it to that individual. Um, the role in the middle is the holder. So this is the individual who receives one of these credentials and can keep it for their own records for as long as they like. And if they choose, they can uh, present it or, or share it to a verifier. Uh, and that verifier might be you know, an organization that's gonna check um, that you're a valid uh, registered driver in a given state in the context of our uh, rental car example. Uh, or for healthcare, it might be an organization like a, a school that wants to make sure that students have been uh, have received vaccinations before they return to school um, for a given term. Uh, and that's a very common kind of workflow that happens today uh, in schools everywhere, but can create a lot of friction for consumers to be able to get all the right records and send faxes or emails. Um, and so using a standard like verifiable credentials and a workflow like this one can really help to ease that burden. So I wanna say a few things about the Smart Health Cards project, but before I do, I wanna just give you a sense of the level of community and participation that we've had in this project over the last year. So this is in many ways an update since the, the last presentation that I gave on this topic at Dev Days, and really all of this is new. Uh, so we've launched a, a major community effort um, together with an organization called VCI. That's kind of a community of participants who want to help make this technology work for consumers. Uh, and so this slide is showing some folks who are participating through that VCI group, others who have participated in a number of HL7 fire um, connectathons around smart health cards. Um, and so we've got major vendors in the US, so organizations like Epic and Cerner, who have implementations of this technology that they brought to the connectathon for testing and are starting to roll out into production. We're working with major health systems like, uh, like Mayo Clinic. Um, Apple announced just yesterday at the Worldwide Developers Conference that they're building support uh, for smart health cards into the next release of iOS. So that's available for developers now and it'll be available in beta for, for wider distribution uh, in just a couple of weeks, I think. So the screenshot that I've got on the right-hand side comes from the documentation that, that Apple produced. 
Um, there's actually only one place today where health cards are, are live in production for individual end users to access, uh, and that is in the province of Quebec in Canada. But there's a lot more news coming on that front. Uh, and you'll hear more about VCI as an organization during tomorrow's keynote. So I won't dwell on this, but I want to emphasize uh, that there is a robust community around this work, and we're starting to see production implementations uh, become more broadly available, both for issuers and for holders, um, as well as the community of organizations that would, that would have some interest in verifying these results. So having given you that quick sense of the community, let me dig in and, and talk about some of the goals and some of the technology. And then I'll have a chance to show you some uh, demonstrations of the tools that we've got today. Um, as I mentioned, the, the key aim is to put consumers in charge of deciding uh, when and how to share information. So that could be lab results or immunizations uh, or even other healthcare records. Uh, and the aim with smart health cards is not to over index on just one use case like verifiable COVID-19 immunization results, although that is an important use case. We wanna support COVID-19 lab results, COVID-19 immunizations, uh, but also lay out a groundwork, provide the infrastructure for sharing any kinds of fire data in a verifiable way. Um, and in part, this is because this is part of a much broader project for individuals to get access to their clinical records. And in part, it's because even in the space of COVID-19 immunizations and lab results, the data can be surprisingly rich and complicated. Uh, and, and some of this comes from the fact that the science and our understanding of immunizations and lab results is still evolving. So if I try to summarize an immunization with a simple statement like, Josh is fully immunized, uh, that is true today according to our CDC guidelines. But in the future, that could change based on what specific immunizations I received and the, the time scale on which I received them, and also based on other kinds of context. So rather than sharing these kinds of high level conclusions, with the health cards work, we are really focused on modeling the clinical data in, in the richness and complexity that it really presents us. Now the aim is to provide kind of a, a boiled down set of results for specific use cases. Um, so understanding what are the relevant facts about a COVID-19 immunization or lab result that I would want in the context of a specific scenario um, like returning to a workplace or to school uh, or international travel. Uh, those would be examples of the kinds of use cases for which we want to make sure these data payloads uh, are useful. And the aim is to really build on open standards uh, to support a model where there might be many organizations around the world issuing these kinds of health cards, many different wallet apps to choose from, and indeed some consumers may choose no wallet app at all. Uh, they might only have um, access or might choose not to use a smartphone and just maintain smart health cards printed on paper. So we'll talk about those models as well. Um, and the aim is that there can be many relying parties. Anyone who wants to ask or request uh, an individual share these data can ask, and it's up to the individual to make the decision without any pre-coordination uh, and without having to, to buy in or sign agreements or, or pay to participate, but an open set of standards that anyone can implement um, so let me give you a quick example from the sort of pre-health card days to highlight some of the challenges. Uh, and I should say that the, the challenges um, that we have today uh, are significant, but we've also made a lot of progress. Uh, so if you think about what you could do with just access to the Smart on Fire APIs, um, there's a lot that you can do today. As a consumer, you can connect any app of your choice to a data provider that has your health information. So what does that mean in practice? Well, uh, maybe I get a lab test done at a lab facility. Uh, today, even without health cards, I could download those results in um, a portal or using a mobile app that's provided to me by that lab vendor. And I could find some way to share those results. So, you know, for example, when I had um, a uh, test done last year, COVID-19 uh, serology result, you know, I got this printout from LabCorp. I got it. Um, electronically as well as on paper uh, with this detailed lab report, including lots of information about uh, me as a patient, my name, my, my birth date, all these kinds of details that I'm comfortable sharing here, uh, just, just because sometimes it's useful to have really concrete examples to work from. Um, specifically what anti antibodies were tested for and whether the results were negative or positive, all of these detail in a PDF. And if I want to, I could figure out how to take this PDF and fax it to somebody or email them a copy of it. Um, and that would be one mode of sharing. The challenge here, uh, if, I, if I share that way, 
is that there's no good way to verify that the information hasn't changed. I could very easily take that PDF and edit it to change a positive to a negative or to change a date or a name. And there would be no way to, to detect um, based on just sharing that PDF. Um, so that's a place where, where the sharing workflows are, are quite possible, but we don't quite get this level of verifiability that we'd like to have in a system. On the other hand, I could decide um, to use Smart on Fire to share those data directly from LabCorp in this example with an app uh, of my choice. And, and so maybe that app could be run by a verifier. I could connect that verifier directly to the source of the information. And they could see that it was coming directly from the source and know that it hadn't been altered. Uh, and so that is actually a good result in terms of helping guide me through a process of sharing uh, and providing results that are verifiable to, um, to the, the party that I'm sharing with. But it actually fails on another measure, which is this is number one, causing uh, potentially oversharing. I might be sharing access to all immunizations when I really only want to share access to a limited set, just like the, the COVID immunization. Uh, or I might be sharing all lab results when I just wanted to share one or two. Uh, this is work that we're aiming to close in the SMART V2 granular scopes project. So if you're interested in learning more about that, um, we'll have a session tomorrow focused on uh, the SMART app launch project. But even if we could get through that problem, it also introduces one other privacy concern, which is tracking. If I need to connect every different verifying party back to the source of truth, uh, for example, the lab, that means the lab can understand and have visibility into everywhere I go uh, and everywhere that I use that result. Uh, and that's highly undesirable from a privacy perspective. It's much better to have a design that lets consumers be in control without having to reveal that information upstream each time they share. So let's talk a little bit about what goes into these kinds of health cards. And we'll, we'll stay focused on the COVID-19 examples because they're, they're front and center. Uh, but the real aim here is to combine the strengths of two uh, open standards, one being the W3C verifiable credentials data model, and the other being the, the FIRE clinical data models. Uh, both of these uh, can be represented uh, using JSON properties. And I'll give an example of a, a JSON structure that uh, combines these, uh, just, just to give you a sense of what I'm talking about. So the JSON structure that I'm gonna scroll through here, it represents the data payload of a smart health card with a COVID-19 immunization result. And right at the center of this data payload is a fire bundle. We'll get to the fire bundle in a minute. But before we do, I wanna talk about the, the wrapping data structure that's sitting around this bundle. Uh, and these are using data fields or data elements that are defined in the, the verifiable credentials data model. First is an issuer. So this is a, a link to the organization that actually created this card. So for example, in my lab example, this might be the lab that did a lab test, uh, or it might be a pharmacy that gave an immunization. The issuer is whoever is responsible for making the statements inside of this health card. NBF is a, a cryptic three-letter uh, term that stands for not before. Uh, the idea is basically this is the date uh, as a Unix timestamp at which this credential becomes valid. And so if you see a, a credential that's issued as not before some date in the future, you know, well, this is not valid yet. Uh, and this can be helpful in, in certain scenarios when you want to know um, really when one of these credentials was, was issued and when it's intended to, to start being useful. Uh, and then next we got a list of types. And the idea here is that every health card can have an array of types that helps identify, first of all, that it is a health card. Uh, and then more in finer grained detail, what, what's it really about? So what, what, whether it has information about immunizations or labs, if it's about a specific disease like COVID-19, that can be surfaced here in this array of types as well. Uh, and you can think of it, about these types like tags. Uh, so it's possible to, to ask if a given health card meets one or more types. So if you have a verifier that's interested in learning about COVID-19 immunization results, they might ask about uh, health cards that have both of these types attached to them. So there are immunizations and they're about COVID-19 and the intersection of those types is what that verifier would be interested in. So that's uh, all just kind of the surrounding framework that tells us who issued this health card, when did they issue it, and what general kind of stuff will we find inside. And then the FIRE bundle does the heavy lifting of clinical semantics. Uh, and we use a, a very constrained set of profiles that I'll talk about um, in a bit. But effectively, uh, this vaccination result would include one resource representing a patient. And we include just enough information, just enough demographics to bind this back to a real world identity. Uh, the basic advice here is first name, last name, and date of birth. 
even if an issuer knows more information like a street address or a medical record number, we advise us to not include that information in these health cards because we want uh, to avoid oversharing. The idea is just enough to bind this back to a real world identity that somebody might present alongside the health card. So we'll talk about that more in a bit. And then there's two resources in the bundle that are sort of clinical data. Uh, they're both immunizations in this case. And again, we have a highly constrained profile so that just the relevant fields, uh, what immunization product was given, when was it given, and what organization gave it, and what was the lot number. Those are the basic fields that we convey uh, inside of this bundle. So we have those fields for the first immunization dose, which in this example was January 1st of 2021. And then we have the same kind of information for the second dose, which in this example was January 29th, 2021. And that bundle of three fire resources, a patient and two immunizations, uh, sort of tells the story uh, of this health card. Now, if you're looking closely, you might notice these full URLs associated with each bundle resource uh, look interesting. Uh, they consist of the word resource and then a colon and then a number. And the idea here is we wanna keep these bundles small. We'll talk about why in a little bit, uh, but to keep them small, we need very short URIs that can be used for res resolving these references just in the context of this bundle. So if I want to refer to a patient from this immunization, I can refer to it as resource zero in the bundle. And uh, if I look up here, I'll see that my patient has a full URL of resource zero in this bundle, so I can correctly make that link. So that's an idea, uh, an example of the kind of JSON structure that you can expect to find inside of a health card. And it gives you a sense of how we use some properties from the W3C verifiable credentials data model. We use some demographics from the FHIR administrative resources like patient, and we use clinical data from the FHIR clinical domain resources like immunization or observation or potentially condition um, and, and others where you might want to create these kinds of packages of data. Now, this verifiable credential, this health card is tied back to an individual, individual identity um, using those kinds of demographic attributes I pointed out, name and, and birth date. And the expectation is that this health card doesn't prove who you are. It just demonstrates that somebody with this name and birth date received a specific immunization dose. Um, and so it's designed to be used together with traditional forms of identity. Uh, so when we think about the identity proofing um, problem, the aim is that when somebody gives you a health card, they need to have some good assurance about who you are. But when you present a health card, you would typically do it alongside some uh, other traditional means of identity, like a physical driver's license or state ID, or a student account inside of a student information system, or a traveler account inside of an airline uh, website. Those would be examples uh, of how the organization that you're sharing information with knows who you are. And it's important that they know who you are before they can really evaluate the information inside of a health card, because if, if they don't know who you are, they can't be sure that that information is actually about you. So let's dig into the protocol a little bit. We've talked about the data format, which is a great place to start uh, because it gives you a sense of what the health card is all about. Let's talk now about data flows for issuing a health card. How does an individual consumer get one of these things? Uh, and there's a few possibilities here, and, and we're seeing innovation around how these can be delivered. But one simple example is a, a provider might give you a health card printed out on a sheet of paper. It might have a design like the reference design that I'm showing here uh, on the right hand side of this slide, where there's a QR code that embodies a, a digital representation of all the details uh, of that JSON bundle that I showed, as well as human readable tabular information explaining exactly what's in that QR code. So with a piece of paper like this, you know what information is being shared about you or what information you've got about the immunization that was given. And you can decide if you wanna let somebody scan this QR code later. So you might get this on a physical piece of paper. Uh, an issuer might also offer you something like this as a PDF to download from a patient portal or from an app that the issuer provides. We also define a standardized JSON file format which is particularly useful if we want to pass along a whole set of health cards all at once, rather than trying to juggle these different PDFs or juggle different QR codes. Uh, it's possible to pack a set of these things inside of what's called a dot smart health card JSON file. Uh, and we also provide a fire based issuance flow. So if an issuer supports uh, smart on fire APIs, then they can also host uh, an operation that we've defined called a health cards issue operation that allows a consumer facing app like 
um, the Common Health app on Android or the Apple Health Records app on iOS uh, to connect and ask for these kinds of health cards, just the same way they would ask for other clinical data through the Fire REST API. And that can provide a really seamless flow for individuals to get access to these data using an app that they might already have uh, installed and connected on their phones. So that's a little bit about how the issuance side of things works. Let me say a few things about um, presentation. So if I have a health card, maybe on a piece of paper, or maybe as a digital artifact in a health records app or health wallet, how can I share that um, health card with somebody who's, who'd like to request this information about me? Um, so one very simple flow is to display that QR code on your phone's screen or on a piece of paper. Um, another flow would be to upload or email that file, or you know, I'll, I'll, I'll make a note here, even send a fax uh, with that QR to be able to share it. Uh, or similarly, you could upload that JSON file I mentioned, which again, could be useful for larger data sets. And we're also seeing uh, some pretty rapid innovation on the mobile side to be able to share data between um, different apps on a device. So for example, in the system that Apple Health Records has put together on iOS, apps can request data from the Health Records app, which is kind of an OS level function, and third-party apps can request uh, access to health cards and a user it would be presented with a dialogue to say whether they want to share those health cards or not. Um, so those kinds of APIs might vary by mobile OS, but we're seeing pretty rapid um, development of different sharing capabilities on that front. But what all of these presentations mode, all these presentation flows have in common is the data set and the cryptographic signatures that go into this data set uh, are consistent across all of them. It's the same data payload however you want to share that information from point A to point B. So I mentioned QR encoding a few times, uh, and I wanna say just a few things about QR encoding without wading too deeply into the details, uh, but QR codes are, are very much a finite resource. There's only so much data that you can pack into a QR code before it gets quite difficult to scan. Uh, and so based on some initial testing, uh, we decided that the most data dense QR codes that we wanted to support with smart health cards are something called a, a V22 symbol. And that's roughly what you see in this example here. Um, that, that was a good balance between data density and ease of scanning. Um, and what we said is that if you've got more data than you can fit in one of these QR codes, we have a method to divide it into several chunks and create a QR code for each chunk. But in general, we, we think the user experience around those chunks uh, could be quite challenging. So we wanted to make sure uh, that for our common use cases, for all the, the, the sort of use cases we know about, like sharing immunization records or sharing a lab result, you should be able to fit the data you need into a single chunk, which is to say, fit it into a single QR code. And we use um, what's called a numeric encoding mode. I won't go into the details unless folks are interested, uh, but the upshot of it is that when you scan one of these health cards, maybe even just using the camera app on your phone, what you get is a URI. And that URI starts with a, with a prefix or a URI scheme that we call SHC for smart health card. Uh, and then it includes a string of digits between zero and nine, which encode the actual data. Um, and there's a scheme for, for turning that into a JSON web signature where every pair of digits gets turned into one character. So there's an algorithm for taking the data in that QR code, uh, and, and decoding it to get out a signed, a cryptographically signed object. So that's just a little bit about what goes into QR codes. But what I wanted to do before we open up uh, for questions is take five minutes and give folks a quick demo of some of the tools and resources that are available, uh, starting with the specifications themselves. Uh, so I've mentioned smart health cards as, as though it is a monolithic entity, but actually there are two core specifications uh, that we've worked on as a community. First is what we call the framework implementation guide. So this lives at spec.smarthealth.cards. And this provides all the detail about how to do cryptographic signatures, uh, how to discover the keys associated with an issuer, how to create those QR codes, uh, how to chunk them up if necessary. It defines the fire operations for requesting and issuing these health cards. All of that is the purview of this framework IG. The other document, the other specification, is what's called uh, the FHIR data profiles for vaccination and testing. Uh, and so these are being standardized through HL7 uh, during the upcoming ballot cycles. Uh, but the idea here is this provides a set of FHIR profiles that can describe things like COVID-19 lab results or immunizations 
And every time we define a profile, like the immunizations profile, we also define what's called a DM or data minimizing version of that profile that leaves you just the fields that we think are necessary for this use case, because we want to make it as easy as possible to detect implementations that might be including more data than are necessary. Ultimately, there's a privacy story here, which we'll talk about um, in a bit. Uh, and there's a balancing act to including just the right data that you need without oversharing. So those are the two key specifications. We also have some tools that demonstrate uh, what it looks like um, to make use of these. And we've got op an open source, very simple wallet demonstration that allows you to connect to a smart on fire server and call that issuance API to fetch a set of data. Uh, it's a very simple fire server that doesn't require you to sign in or click any buttons to approve. So that OAuth flow is about the fastest OAuth flow you can imagine, but it just fetches um, any results from that issuance API and then can display them as a QR uh, that you can present. So this is just designed to give you the flavor of the kind of job that a wallet would do. And we also have a set of demo portals that are really a great developer tool to help you understand exactly what the process of issuing and verifying a smart health card looks like. Um, so this first link here is about issuing health cards. That's the developer portal. And the second link here is about verifying health cards. That's the verifier portal. And I'll give you just a, a one minute overview about what this looks like, but it takes you through the sequence of steps, starting with the fire bundle that includes the clinical data and starting with a, a JSON web key, which is used for cryptographic signatures. Um, you can paste in your own data here, but there's also sort of a, a quick button to download a, a sample from the spec itself and just use that to get started. And similarly, you can paste in your own key here, but there's also a button that will just grab the, the key from the specification itself. Uh, and you'll see that when I press the question mark here, I'm getting the option to grab that demo key from the website, but I'm also getting a lot of helpful documentation that explains uh, what this bundle and what this key actually do. Um, so there's, it's easy to trace the meaning of each of these steps. But once you've got a fire bundle and an issuer key, uh, this tool will take you through this, the process of embedding that fire bundle inside of a verifiable credential date. And you can see it's populating the issuer and that not before date, each time I click it, that is, that is ticking up like the clock. So it creates that JSON payload, like the one that we looked at earlier. Um, and it minifies the payload to make sure that there's no extra white space um, in that JSON structure. And then it calls uh, a deflate compression algorithm. So that's a standardized compression algorithm that can reduce um, repeating information. Uh, it's basically uh, like a gzip algorithm, and that can help keep the end payloads smaller. Uh, and then this whole structure could be packed inside of a JSON web signature object. And then finally, once you've packed it inside of a JSON web signature object, you can attach a signature. And you can see each time I press the sign button, there's a little bit of randomness that goes into that signature. But a JSON web signature can, contains a header, a payload, and a signature. Uh, and those three components together make up the key, or the core aspects of a smart health card. From there, I can pack it into the JSON structure that I mentioned as a smart health card JSON file, or I can encode it into this string of digits that I mentioned. That's called the numeric encoding operation. Uh, and that can be used to directly generate a QR code based on that string of digits. So this is an example that goes into quite a lot of detail, but takes you through the whole process of generating a health card step by step. Uh, there's also a validation SDK, which is a command line tool that allows you to take a health card and run a series of tests on it. If there's interest, I can do a quick demonstration of that tool, but I wanna save time for questions. Um, so we'll do that only if there's interest. I wanna to touch on a couple of common questions before we open up to, uh, to questions from Buba. So one is the relationship between health cards and what you might think of as a health pass or a passport. Um, the goal with smart health cards is really to capture a clear set of clinical data that can give an individual a copy of their records and let them use it as they see fit. This is a little different from the goal of a pass, which is to determine whether it's okay for someone to go back into a workplace or show up at school or get on an international flight. A pass is a kind of summary artifact that encompasses some clinical data, some context, uh, maybe a survey asking people if they've had symptoms and it involves some set of rules some set of rules that go into the pass framework to say who's allowed to pass and who isn't. And those rules uh, can change over time. 
as the science evolves and as public policy evolves. And so the goal in health cards is really not to define these kinds of executable logic uh, or passes at all. We are focused on the upper left-hand side of this diagram to provide verifiable inputs uh, so that verifiers can use it as they see fit, maybe as part of a broader program that involves these kinds of passes, but perhaps also just as a standalone artifact. Uh, there are some practical challenges here. Um, a couple that I wanted to highlight, uh, especially in the US where we have a broad immunization program and we make COVID-19 immunizations available for free, is that individuals often don't have their identity carefully checked at the point when an immunization is given. Uh, and if the records about the recipient of that vaccine aren't correct, uh, if the name or the birth date are about somebody else, um, that's an example of a system where garbage in, garbage out. You can't do any better uh, than, than what kind of identity proofing was provided at that point of care. And that doesn't mean that we can't make good use of these health cards. It just means that there are limitations uh, to how much faith you can put in them. And similarly, there are limitations to how much faith you can put in the vaccine. We're often dealing with probabilities in this space, but it's still useful to be able to provide uh, these kinds of artifacts uh, and some guarantees downstream. Uh, I want to highlight a trade-off between privacy and, um, and the strength of identity binding. And uh, the more information you pack into one of these health cards about who a person is, the better job you can do of, of matching that up with somebody's identity in an outside system. But you might also coerce folks into oversharing, uh, which is something we really want to avoid. So we've tried to define a minimal data set uh, for binding this to an external identity and stop right there. So name and birth date is what we lined up on uh, in the context of US-based US issuance. Um, and maybe the last point that I'll make here is how do you know which issuers are trustworthy? In theory, anyone can issue a health card, but only certain clinical organizations uh, actually should be trusted uh, to provide accurate information. And so part of the work of deploying health cards in the broader world uh, has to do with defining which issuers uh, a verifier might trust. And health cards does not provide a kind of trust framework for doing this, but we do provide hooks so that trust frameworks can be layered on top. Um, so if there's interest, I can talk about that a little bit more as we go. I also wanna point folks directly to the FAQ that's built into the health cards spec, uh, because it goes through a few of the more common questions that I didn't get a chance to talk through in this presentation. So let me pause there. Um, and let's take a look at Whova for questions that folks have submitted, and I'll do it in the order of votes. So I see there's one question that has bubbled up to the top of the list, asking any progress creating an in case of emergency solution that allows ER scenarios accessing your critical health data without having to go through a break the glass operation. So for example, an Android or iOS platform um, in case of emergency feature that lets you put critical health cards in a wallet and have, give practitioners access. And that's a great question. It's an example where um, the same way that I might display information um, on the home screen of, screen of my phone in case of emergency, we could think about including links or QR codes for health cards. I haven't seen that come up yet, but the technology that we've defined here could certainly be used in that context. And it has the really nice property that that sort of information uh, could be shared directly um, at the point of an emergency without needing to broker this kind of business to business trust, uh, but an individual might be able to include that information, whether or not they were awake and able to explicitly share, uh, they could think about that ahead of time and make the information available. I think that's a, that's a great example. Um, next question on the list, how can health cards or can health cards be extended even from other entities than the issuer to avoid overflow of health cards? Um, so I, I think maybe the way that I would interpret this question is, let's say in the case of immunizations, I'm getting lots of different immunizations over time. Maybe I have a series of, of COVID immunizations. And what I kind of want is at the end of the series, one health card that encapsulates all the details of the immunizations in that series. On the other hand, um, I might get lots of lab tests over time and I don't necessarily want to roll them all up into one giant health card because I might want to share them individually. So the basic advice that we give in the specification itself really boils down to uh, these kinds of use cases. What we say is uh, that when issuers are generating health cards, this is sort of in the, the privacy section, the granularity of information to disclose should be at the level of the whole credential. And so you should issue credentials with just the minimum information for a given use case. 
And if there's fire profiles available for that use case, you should leverage those profiles. So it's a little bit of a balancing act. And I'd say we're still learning to a large extent um, exactly what makes uh, the, these data useful and how rolled up or how much data should be rolled up into these cards. Um, and we're starting off in a fairly granular way. But yes, issuers can pack more into these data or into these cards. So there's another question from Joshua Kelly asking, how do you see the coordination of trusting particular issues playing out, uh, trusting particular issuers playing out in the US and elsewhere? Uh, so in the US, on the one hand, there are some real structural challenges because every state manages its own set of records. We have some centralized reporting that goes up to the federal level, but it's generally at the de-identified level rather than individual uh, information about which people received which, which vaccines. Um, and so when we think about issuing at scale, we're really thinking about a few major groups of issuers that, that have the potential to scale. One is retail pharmacies. So we're working closely with a group of some of the largest retail pharmacies. Uh, Walmart, for example, has made a public announcement um, about their plan to support smart health carts and issuing these cards. That's a pretty good scaling story. Another is working with a large electronic health record vendors. So I mentioned Epic and Cerner have both committed to issuing health cards and have come to, to Connectathons and tested those implementations. Uh, and so that can scale to healthcare providers across the US. Uh, and then finally, we have this system of state level immunization registries. And this could be a politically sensitive topic, but I think it's fair to say in some states, um, there's a lot of concern about this. And in other states, um, there's a strong push to make these data available uh, from the state uh, or from organizations that the state nominates uh, based on those registries that the state already maintains. So those are three stories about how health cards issuance can scale in the US. And so as a verifier, what you really want is a list of, okay, who are all those issuers that fit into one of those three buckets? And so some of the work that we're doing in BCI is trying to focus on making that as easy as possible. So working with um, a registry or a list of issuers uh, so that it can be easier to bootstrap that trust process. Elsewhere, uh, like in the EU, for example, uh, there, there tends to be more tolerance of centralization, maybe at the, the country level, to, to say maybe there could be some public key infrastructure uh, where you can represent the hierarchical trust um, up to a root of trust uh, so that these kinds of health cards or, or other artifacts can be signed uh, in a way that, um, that is more centralized or that scales up better. In the US, that's hard. Um, another question from Tim. Uh, no, we did that one already. Here's a question from Lakshmi asking, related to the ONC requirement, where a patient is required to check or uncheck scope at the resource level, is it required and can an auth server display all the scopes that a client requires and a patient clicks allow or deny? So this is not a question about health cards directly. Um, it's more a question about the Smart on Fire API. Uh, and yes, in that context, the idea is that individuals should be able to uncheck certain resource types that they don't want to share. Uh, but there's a close sort of spiritual affiliation um, of this kind of sharing decision in health cards as well, which is a verifier is asking for certain information and an individual gets to share exactly the health cards that they pick. So they could do that by choosing which, which card to share from a paper-based record or from an app of their choice. They can select one or zero or any number affirmatively. And then only those cards get shared. So there's a very strong, um, transparency model about exactly what goes over. Uh, there's one more question which, uh, which we haven't done yet, which is how is the JSON structure combining responses from these different fire resources? And can we combine data from other resources on top of it? For example, after patient demographics, can we add appointments? So at the level of the framework itself, we say any fire bundle can go into a health cart but it's very helpful to have well-defined data profiles that spell out what you need for a given use case. And that's a major motivation for taking this work through the HL7 standards process around the, the vaccination uh, and testing IG is to make sure that we've got a consistent understanding of what we need for that use case. And there's probably similar work required for other use cases, maybe, maybe in the appointment space uh, to take that example. So we're at time, really appreciate um, the attention and the questions, and we've got an open channel on Zulip in the smart slash health cards space. So come and subscribe if you're interested in learning more. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Josh. Appreciate your time and your presentation today. Please monitor the Q&A channel 
um, in Whova if there's any additional follow ups after the session. And be sure to rate the session by clicking on the link in Whova. And have a great day.